looks at as he looks, continues to look in these chambers, he finds lying inside prehistoric mummies and skeletons of unusual size that he said measured anywhere from seven to 10 feet in length. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chariot. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. All right, let's go. Welcome back to the podcast, The Mega Man, the Megalithic Marvels, Derek Olson. Dude, Nate, you make that joke every time. The I Mega know. Man. I mean, well, we we're an 80. We're an 80, 80s we're an 80s show. Do you remember? Did you ever play Mega Man, Derek? I did. I didn't really play Mega Man. I was too busy playing Mario Brothers. Hey, should we just go through the bosses here, Nate? Just to make it just a throw I mean, out some bosses. There's Guts Man. Guts Man. Cut Man. Cut Man. Black Man. Ice Man. Fire Man. Bomb Man. <laughs> Mega Man was hard, Derek. It was one of the hardest games. It was really hard to, to beat it. So, What system? Was that on Mario? That was uh, on NES. Okay, that was NES. on NES, yeah. We, we have the treat of, you know, of having of Derek Olsen. Derek Olsen, fresh off of a... Love Lock Cave excursion. A, blur, a blurry That's excursion, right. if, if you may. And we'd love to hear about that because we, we did an episode with you about the Love Lock Caves and all of the craziness around that, the red-haired giants and... Uh, but you were at ground zero. I, f- I feel like, you know, we talked to a, to a, uh, a, a buddy of ours, Dr. Ben Tapper in an episode that we haven't released yet, but we're talking to him about, he, he, he's vying to be the, the blurry man on the street, sort of like the let's cut to the street. Now, uh, we've got Derek Olson here in love lock caves. What's happening down there, Derek, you know, that kind of thing. So, <laughs> but this is fun to get a report about. What's going on in Ground Zero there? Yeah, like you said, I was doing a little traveling. We actually purchased our first ever camping trailer. So it was like our first ever Griswold family camping trip mm. from the Seattle area down to Reno. And so I was trying to fit in as many ancient sites along the way that I could. We were with some other families, so couldn't do everything I wanted. But there's so much to see in that NorCal, Nevada area. As you guys know, I know you've, you've had some time around there. And uh, we didn't have a lot of time to stop in explore around Mount Shasta, but this is a place that intrigues me. Like there's so many mysteries surrounding this mysterious mountain. And uh, Mm. when you are traveling from I-5 south towards Shasta, when you hit the Wairika area. Oh, and we know that well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh Doesn't that area just look, it looks primordial to me. It feels ancient. It also looks like an alien landscape. It's really bizarro out there because you come. Yeah. It goes it from isn't. Like, like Shasta to this flat, like almost desert land. It's close to where, where I grew up. And Really? Yeah. I've Chico. driven that road a hundred times, you know, going yeah. from going from playing in Sacramento up to, to Portland. You drive that drive. Did you guys ever notice, if you look close on the foothills surrounding Shasta, you see these rock walls that literally go up and over these foothills. Have you guys seen those? These are built using volcanic andesite stone, I believe, stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And if you look at them, you know, on Google Earth, these are massive. And up close, there's one that kind of comes along the road and it's a lot bigger than it would seem, taller. All that to say, I think these walls might be more ancient than we know and have something to do with some of the other mysteries of the area. So, Obviously, Shasta is known to be a portal of sorts, lots of UFO activity. Yeah, um, It's really sacred to the Native Americans of the area, uh, namely the Wintu and Madoc tribes, I believe, who say it's their native place of worship. 
And so mm-hmm. I thought I'd let you guys know, I sent you a picture uh, among the mythical creatures that are believed to inhabit Shasta is the mythical Mata Kagmi, which is the Marak word for Bigfoot. And mm-hmm. this guy's said to be between eight to 10 feet tall. He's covered in coarse hair, has brown eyes and gives off a musky odor. And that picture I sent you is a supposed Mata Kagmi that was photographed years ago. And of course, it's nice and blurry. What do you there. think? It's right in our wheelhouse. Very blurry. Look at him. Yeah. No, I mean, Mount Shasta is wild. And that's what I like about you, Derek, is like, you know, you you bring awareness to these to the average guys like us. And all of a sudden you're like, there's megalithic stuff everywhere, you know? And we were talking about that last night on our channels about how these giants went all over the place. They were building dynasties everywhere. You know, it's it's great, Derek, because you taught us a lot, and then we we interview these other people, and we bring the stuff that you've you've collected, and it's just this big community of people sharing what they've learned, making more sense that this megalithic stuff is everywhere. The giants are everywhere. They were on islands. They were cruising around the world, and there's just these moments, and I and it's cool because like I've driven that road a lot. I probably have seen what you're talking about, but I didn't have the mega the mega glasses on. You know what I mean? You didn't have your megalithic goggles on, right? Yeah, you got to sell those. Where's the merch store? Let's get right. it. I need to up my game. I need yeah. to. I'm going to learn a lesson. I'm going to steal from you guys and just start making this sick merch. The mega goggles, just like little pyramids in the bottoms, you know, when you put them on. <laughs> <laughs> and they have to be 3D. You have to go, red, go. In the, red in the blue. Just to make things blurry. <laughs> Sorry. 3D blurry goggles to go with uh, a t shirt, right? <laughs> Derek, Derek, when you talk about the walls, I, I mean, there's something that I, that I literally, there are these type of rock walls by my parents' house. Like, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, close, to the bay, they, close to the bay, they call them, not in the front yard, not in the backyard, but they call them the, the East Bay walls. They're yeah, weird. They, the go, on, they go on top of hills and they're like, you know, it's like. Sounds like you're talking like, about something different, though, Derek, right? No, I mean, um, I don't necessarily know exactly what you're talking about, Luke, but it sounds like it could be similar. All I'm saying is, the NorCal area, especially much more ancient than we've been led to believe. And when you piece together all these different legends, oral traditions that we're going to get into here that I saw just on this amazing camping trip. Another thing to say about Shasta before moving on. So thousands upon thousands make pilgrimages there every year. It's kind of like a new age Mecca, uh, kind of like uh, Sedona. And this is mostly due to this legend of Lemuria that says somewhere deep beneath the mountain is this complex world of tunnels and and this hidden city called Telos. And it's home to these ancient Lemurians. And there's even people that have reported seeing like seven foot tall creatures with long flowy hair in the mountains that are supposed offspring of the Lemurians. Um, There's even a photo I have, and I sent it to you guys, um, that shows this these doors that go into the mountain itself mm. a pretty rare photo i'm doing more research on that but as you can see it's almost megalithic in style in that there's a section of the mountain right where it's literally been cut away it kind of reminds me of amaru muru in peru where there's that stargate portal where there's that t cut out in the mountain this, that's what yeah. this looks like but then inside at the center bottom of that space are these doors that literally go into the mountain. Obviously, they've been cemented, bolted, and sealed off. But isn't that kind yeah, of crazy? Weird. Yeah. That is weird, dude. That's like Lord of the Rings stuff. And like Hugh, and there's like a young Hugh Jackman standing in the front in the front of this picture, too. Yeah. That's like <laughs> the I mean, that's there's like the Mines of Moria, where like I remember being a kid, Derek. And I love the Hobbit, the original Hobbit cartoon where you like they hold the key up in the moonlight and then they go inside the mountain. And that's where my mind's going. You're blowing my mind. I mean, we've talked a little bit about Shasta. We're trying to get Luke's. Didn't your sister in law go to Shasta and have some weird she experiences? Did. Dude, my, yeah, this ah. is, we keep teasing this, but my sister in law is eventually going to come on and talk about oh. going there for a Bigfoot hunt. And then she, I'm not going to spoil the story, but a bunch of really weird stuff happened when she was there. She was there with with Keisha, of all things. The uh, wake up in the morning feeling like P Diddy. That that Keisha. No. And, uh, yeah. And they wow. went and they did some like night expedition. It's 
I'm not going to spoil the story, but it's it's fun, it's bizarre. And like, you know, we grew up going to Mount Shasta, Derek. Like, I went, I would ski there, like either that or Lassen, which is now closed, or Tahoe. You know, as a kid, Shasta's bizarre. There's like a ton of new age weird stuff that happens there. Like they talk about vortexes there. Like they talk about vortexes in Sedona. There's like this. There's a lot of very bizarre stuff. And then there's even a David Politis episode in The Missing 411 where a guy walks into nothing and disappears. The footsteps go disappear. No evidence. What's one of the craziest ones there is? It's on Mount Shasta. Yeah, I was going to say, that's why I learned about Mount Shasta was David Politis and listening to all the Missing 411 stuff and the weird stuff that goes on up up there. And supposedly the Native Americans wouldn't go past a certain elevation. Yeah, and then there's the people talk about ascended masters, like people are meeting these entities on the mountains and UFOs. I mean, yeah, I mean, this whole topic at some point probably deserves an episode, and and it really does because the place is so weird. The the, the Shasta story actually gets even better, so maybe this is kind of an episode. There we go. Where it's highlighted, but I've got something else to share, and I, uh, Nate, I'm so glad you brought up the mines of Moria, Ed, because that's where we're going here. So. Like you said, like your sister knows, Luke, Shasta is known for all these mysteries. And it's known for subterranean tunnels and many disappearances, children disappearing. And it's also known for, are you ready for this? Mm. Some giant legends. No. Yeah. And I'm about to share with you the best one. There's a fairly well-known legend around the area about a man named J.C. Brown. Have you guys heard the legend of old J.C. Brown? I have not. So this dude appears to be a real guy who lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He was a British prospector who uh, in 1904 was hired by the, I believe it's the Lord Cowdray Mining Company of England to prospect for gold around California and the Mount Shasta region. So one day... Uh, JC is out surveying in the wilds of the Mount Shasta area. He's, he probably just climbed over one of the stone walls and he is surveying and he comes across this cliff. And again, this is somewhere near Mount Shasta. And he eventually he wants to go down. So he makes his way down to the bottom of this cliff. Somehow he's looking around. And he notices what looks like a tunnel entrance at the base of this cliff. Uh, But it's blocked by lots of fallen rock debris and stuff. So he begins digging and excavating. I believe it was hours on end, according to the legend. And uh, eventually he clears his way through. And sure enough, to his amazement, is this massive tunnel that he says appears to have been man-made and it's it's huge it measures like 10 feet tall by seven feet wide and so jc brown ventures deep inside the tunnel going down and according to reports this thing was miles long and after going deeper and deeper into the tunnel he begins to find an assortment of ancient oddities Um, including the remnants that he says were some type of ancient mining activity and tools, Nate. And he also, as he goes deeper, he comes, he starts to come across a valuable treasure. I believe some of it was gold, Um, but that's never the, uh, the highlight of the story. He ventures even deeper into the tunnel and he begins to find these chambers. And in these chambers are inscriptions and symbols, almost like cuneiform. And these chambers also hold some artifacts. Uh, But what gets better is that as he looks, continues to look in these chambers, he finds lying inside prehistoric mummies and skeletons of unusual size that he said measured anywhere from seven to 10 feet Mm. in length. Mm. So fast forward 30 years, that was 1904, 30 years later, this guy appears in Stockton, California, 1934. He's trying to get together a a search party. He's told the tale of what he found. And he wants this group of this, he wants this expedition to follow him back to the site, to go into the tunnels and catalog all of these ancient artifacts and skeletons. 
And so apparently they're all getting ready to leave the next morning. They're going to leave. But that night before they leave, JC Brown mysteriously vanishes and uh, members of the expedition suspected foul play. I guess the police were called in to investigate, but they found no reason for his disappearance to be a hoax. All that to say, JC Brown was never heard of again. And now, you know, the legend of JC Brown. J.C. Brown skipped down. Where'd he go, Derek? What happened? You go through a portal? You get taken out? You're abducted? I think they, uh, yeah, they didn't want the secret of the tunnel with the Nephilim giants being revealed to the world. He knew too much. This sounds like the story we uncovered about supposedly something that looked and smelled exactly like this in a cave in Arizona. The Grand Canyon. Right? The Grand Canyon. Exactly like this. A guy, a couple of explorers hike down. They find this canyon inside. They go inside this cliff and they find giants. They find this dark room that they, they said it was like blacker than black and they couldn't even see their hand in front of their face. And then they had a bunch of wild stuff that they found in there. I don't know. It's like they built these, these like, they built these things all over the world and people find them. They're kind of preserved. And then it was, you know, the whole thing with Arizona was allegedly that whole area is now government land. You, it's fenced off. You can't get to. Yeah. It's sort of off limits now, which makes the intrigue a lot much more interesting, right? Yeah. The Shasta thing's fascinating, Derek, because it's like there are lots of stories about things being underneath this mountain, including the Lemurians and their Crystal City and all this stuff, right? Where, you know, and then, and then of course, there's photos and there's doors that are welded shut. It's just bizarre. Like it's hard to explain how bizarre this place is if you haven't been there. And you you were there. Yeah, it's very bizarre, and I do believe that photo is is real. I even know who that guy is. I'm actually trying to track down to uh, interview him to find out more, so that on my next journey, maybe I can't maybe I can't pick the door open if you know what I mean. Oh wow! And go into Lemuria myself. No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> lots of lots of mysteries. I mean, who knows? Maybe those doors go into the tunnel that J.C. Brown found. So that's kind of my point is we've got these oral legends, these tales, but then we've got stuff that's actually real that you can see, touch, and it kind of gives credence to it. A couple hours east after Shasta, uh, we stopped at Donner Pass. Mm. This is off Highway 80, just above Lake Tahoe. Mm -hmm. And Donner Pass is really... It's known by most for it's the infamous Donner Party. I don't know if you guys have heard about them, but for those listening, if you don't know, they were a group of pioneers migrating to California in their old wagon train in the winter of like 1846, I believe. And they get snowed in on the pass. And sadly, they begin to die and freeze and starve. And they had the, the few survivors had to resort to cannibalism in order to survive. So as interesting and crazy as that history is, there's something so much more ancient right there on this amazing white granite outcropping. Yeah, if you're driving if you're driving that road on Highway 80, it's like you're driving through these big old boulders the whole way. And then there's Shasta, uh, not Shasta. There's there's a lake right there, Donner Lake, right? Yeah, Nate, you're right. I think there's Donner Lake down below. Yeah, but you kind of go down this winding road over this bridge. Mm -hmm. And you see, uh, again, most people stop there to see what they call the China Wall, which was this train track wall built by Chinese immigrants back in the 1800s. But again, right below that, as cool as that is, are these petroglyphs. There's over 200 of them. Archaeologists, mainstream say they could be at least 4,000 years old. I think they're a lot much more ancient. I sent you guys a picture but you see all kinds of shapes. One of them is the famous spiral that's seen all over the world, um, which many say is, you know, uh, alluding to a Stargate portal. And something you'll find, though, if you research these Donner Pass petroglyphs, a lot of people say, well, this was the Mardis culture, which is this mysterious culture that they say predated the Washu Native Americans. But if you look into the Mardis culture, these people absolutely disappear from history. Nobody knows where they went or why. Another little mystery for you. So we did Donner Pass. That was cool. And then the grand finale of my trip was going back to Lovelock 10 years later. It was like a high school reunion. It was amazing and uh, would love to 
catch you up. I know we did a show before on Love Lock, so I don't know if you guys want me to give a quick recap about it, or what do you think? Give us a, give us a recap. Was you with, you had the whole L.A. Marzulli story, right? Yeah, the L.A. Marzulli story, and we talked yeah. about Love Lock Cave, and there was like a lake there. Yeah, give us the recap, right. because in case people are jumping into this podcast, yeah. and, you know, in the, in the yeah. middle. Or, quick yeah. bullet point, yeah. Okay, I go, I go back to Love Lock Cave after 10 years. Love Lock is an actual town. It's, it's a small town town in the middle of nowhere about an hour and a half northeast of reno and so you get to this little town man it it, it, that town itself feels like you're in the western days it's just kind of creepy and ancient but it's really hard to find out where this cave is again it'd been 10 years so i didn't just remember how to get there so i i stupidly was gonna believe apple maps app okay so i'm with my father-in-law and we're out following the maps to this cave we're on this desolate road. It takes about another hour from Lovelock just to try to get to this cave out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, it's just kind of that intuition when you when you know you better just stop. And I stop and I'm looking at my map and I realize, you know how your maps will take you to an area, but it doesn't necessarily connect. Mm-hmm. It's taking us to the backside of this mountain range. Mm-hmm. So we would have driven an hour had we not stopped. And in the crazy... 90 plus weather, we would have had to hike over a range, which would have been possible. Mm. So luckily we only wasted like 20 minutes. We go the right way. And I'm kind of looking at Google earth and just trying to remember how to get there. Eventually we get there. And again, this thing is so remote and desolate. It's tucked up against the the foothills there of Lovelock. The cool thing is this time there was nobody else there. Last time I was there, there was a group of people. So it was a little of a bummer. But climbing up into this cave is quite the experience, considering the history I'm about to share. The cave itself feels otherworldly. And right before we go in, my father-in-law and I had quite the scare. We're kind of, there's this plaque at the entrance of the cave and we're looking at it, reading it, and we hear this crazy sound, kind of like this whoosh. And we look at each other and we're, I'm like, what was that? I'm like reaching for my knife. And, uh, we walk slowly in the cave and out flies this huge owl and like just right past our faces and, and scared the heebie jeebies out of us. <laughs> I went deeper into the cave on the left side yeah. and another one flew out and I literally screamed. Sorry, Nate, what were you going to say? I was going to say, you know, you, you, you missed your opportunities to talk about your megalithic marvels machete. You can get it at megalithicmarvels.com. <laughs> when you're hunting for pyramids in the jungle, megalithic marvels machete. When you're hunting. I, I, feel, like you, I, I feel like you need one, Derek. You could sell 100,000 of those right now. You know what you could do is you could you could right away have Tim Alberino be your spokesperson too. <laughs> exactly. It's just the match made in heaven. That's what, when you said that, Derek, I thought you have this machete on your side and this owl comes out and you're, whoosh, you just chopped its head off. When you're hunting for redheaded cannibalistic <laughs> giants, this is the only machete to you. I, I just, you know, I just see Tim Alberino in the jungle and you with him and you guys are just oh, chopping man. down vines trying to find the old giant's playground dude that is so epic i have got to get on your <laughs> merch swag pipeline <laughs> why well, don't we i don't mean to derail us here because we're having no, a good you time did, though i it did was, we were deep in in the owls well, attack I, that, the out when the when owls attack it's like when animals get when, when owls attack. owls are associated with aliens and they're also just like creepy you know they're also associated with the occult because I was going to bring that up earlier in the episode we were talking about, you know, there's supposedly this, in that Northern California, there's this giant Moloch statue that looks like an owl, and it's near what some of the places you were talking about, but we don't, don't have to get, grows. we don't have to. And here well, we you're go. Actually, you're actually kind of, you're pulling the right thread. Are we going? Sure, yeah. Bring it back to, to Lovelock. You're, you, you get startled by an owl. So we get startled by an owl. We go into the cave. And now let me just give the quick bullet points for new listeners to Blurry Creatures, because I know this show is growing so rapidly. So many new members, so many new listeners. We can't assume that everybody's heard every episode, right? We got to onboard these people. So I'm going to onboard them into Lovelock. So the quick recap of Lovelock Cave. So number one, the oral tradition. So the Paiutes of Nevada have this ancient legend that they went 
to war against a ferocious enemy of red-haired cannibalistic giants known as the Sitika. And the legend says that the Paiutes align themselves with other tribes and they trap these giants in a large cave, set it ablaze with fire, and any giants that tried to escape, they shot with fire-piercing arrows. So that was the oral legend. Then there was a written account in 1883, uh, Sarah Winnemucca, she was the daughter of the chief uh, of the Paiutes. She wrote a book called Life Among the Paiutes. In her book, she writes about the, quote, red-haired people eaters that her tribe exterminated and that she had a, a garment passed down generation to generation that was trimmed with this red hair. Mm-hmm. So it went from oral tradition to this written account. And then in 1911, a group of miners are digging out bat dung in this cave. They're digging out hundreds of tons of bat guano to be used as fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And they start to discover countless artifacts and skeletons of giant proportion with red hair. This triggers the archaeologist to come out in 1912 from uh, University of California, Berkeley. And these guys obtain 10,000 plus artifacts. They estimate that the earliest inhabited inhabitants were in the cave at least 4,000 BC. They find donut-shaped notch stone calendars, elaborate duck decoys, which are on display in the uh, Smithsonian right now. But they also start finding gigantic tools, weapons shafts, and skeletons. They find mummified skeletons. I've sent you guys pictures before. One looks like a weird humanoid. And then they find girthy, large skeletons, one measured six foot six. And they have pictures of this in their field guide called Lovelock Cave. So again, this isn't make-believe stuff. These are real archaeologists, L.L. Loud, and another guy that wrote this book. They have pictures, measurements. And basically, they say in their book, Lovelock Cave, that what we found validates the oral tradition of the Paiutes and the testimony of the miners that red-haired giants this race existed. Again, this is in the early 1900s before the stuff got really politically correct, right? So you've got the archaeologists themselves saying, hey, we found six foot six at least skeletons with red hair. And then a bunch of, again, miners and newspaper articles from back in the day. And there's too many to read. They recount all kinds of stories about seven to 10 foot giants that were found in the cave, around the cave, in the dry lake bed, Humboldt Lake down below, I believe it's called. And so, and then not, if that's not good enough, there's a bunch of witnesses who say that they've seen uh, the Lovelock skeleton skulls in a back room at the uh, Humboldt Museum, which is about an hour and a half east of that cave. And they've taken photographs of them. I've really researched this. I believe these photos are accurate. You can go to megalithicmarvels.com, search Lovelock. You'll eventually find these photos. There's at least four skulls they found. One of them dwarfs the others and is really big. And so we've got the photos. And then the actual museum curator at the Humboldt Museum says herself, quote, "Uh, the state does not legitimize the skulls' legitimacy, so we have to hide them in a back room. So that's kind of the recap of the Lovelock cave story. To me, it's one of the greatest. When we talk about ancient America, giant skeletons, this is it. This is the greatest discovery because we don't just have oral legends, uh, book writings. We've got a cave. We've got skeletons, specimens, artifacts, pictures, and quotes from museum curators. So that's kind of the backstory. Mm. And so when I was going up into the cave, again, the first thing that just took me back like it did 10 years ago is that you notice this, the, the roof of the ceiling, the ceiling of the cave, I'm sorry, is charred black, right? Which harkens back to the legend of the fire. And it's important to note that this entire region of Northwest Nevada was covered by a massive lake 12,000 years ago, mm-hmm. a Lake Lahontan. So instead of looking out at a vast desert valley, when you come out of the cave, you have to visualize this whole valley was filled with water, teeming with fish, surrounded by wildlife, the Paiutes fishing below. So this cave had a strategic location where I believe these giants were using it to hide. It was a natural defensive position because I believe they were the hunted. 
again, that which goes back to the legend of the, the tribes coming together to exterminate them. But they also use the cave as an offensive position to launch surprise attacks on the Paiutes below. Mm. And again, that's what the legends say, that the giants would use the tool that grew in the lake, a species of water plant. They would weave these rafts to navigate, to make boats and navigate the water and capture Paiute women who would uh, gather tool near the shore. So I, I, when I was there, I was visualizing this, like imagine 12,000 years ago, you're a Paiute Indian. You're, have, you're just going about your, your daily chores. You're a hunter gatherer. It's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. Gentle breeze is blowing over this ancient lake. You've just been fishing. You're on the shore cleaning them. All is well. You're looking forward to this good meal that you're going to take back to your family when suddenly you hear something on the water and you Mm. look up and there is this reed boat coming right at you with maybe two, three, four, eight to 10 feet tall giants with red hair. And they want you, they grab you. I mean, you would, and they would take you to their cave and, and you know what? Amazing story, right? Yeah. And we hear about this and we talked about this. And I think this episode is going to come out after Heather's. And she talked about it's a specific pigment of red hair. It's 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 more of a kind of an auburny color. It's not like traditional red hair that you would see just like in humans. It's almost like a darker tint to it. And Reeds takes you back to, makes me think of Egypt and the Nile. We talked about that a little bit. Like they're building these these types of boats. So they knew how to sail around. It's wild, Derek, because I've been to so many of these places, and I'm I feel I feel like it's cool. Like when you're talking about this, it's like I haven't been to Love Lovelock Lake Cave specifically, but I've been to that area, and it kind of looks like a dried up lake. It looks like there used to be something going on here, and then it's just it's just turned into like almost a desert. And and that part of the country is interesting. And you know, you hear stories all up and down California, into Nevada. There's up into Montana. It's like how many giants tribes do you think there were in america like do you think they were we just find these little remnants of them like there were there was way more of these uh, populations scattered around because i mean we've already covered a a lot of places from from the donner area to shasta to you know now we're talking about nevada i mean they seem like they were all over the place yeah i think they were probably again they were uh, i would say they were the minority I don't think they were, I think there was probably more ancient peoples than there were uh, these giants. I think there were definitely giant tribes scattered all over, but again, they were the hunted. So they would try to find these uh, strategic defensive positions. I think we talked about that on another show where like on Sardinia, they fled to this Island because it was, um, it was kind of like, you know, having a castle on a moat in the medieval days, it was a defensive place where they could build these Naragi towers and fight uh, the ancient peoples that were coming to exterminate them, like uh, David and the Israelites would have done, David and his giant slayers back in the day, right? Have we talked about this on the show, Derek? Do you think that these things were here pre-flood or post-flood? You know, there's a couple different ways you could look at it about how they these giants might have migrated around the World Definitely, I believe there was giants here, obviously, before the flood, but Genesis 6 makes it pretty clear that they were also here after. One, they could have fled, you know, originally the Canaan area where they they came down, you know, the whole Mount Hermon area, and they begin to spread out as they were being hunted to other locations for refuge. Simultaneously, they probably were wanting to spread their occult practices and, and corrupt new peoples of the world. So one, they could have spread out. We know they had some advanced knowledge and technology. So getting across the waters, they could do. Obviously, uh, I believe they were in Peru. They were in Europe. Or the other option is we know the Watchers descended on Mount Hermon, eventually did their interbreeding with human women. The Bible says they were here also after the flood. So it's that whole second incursion thing. Did they come down through these ancient portals? A lot of that could have to do with occult practices in the area by natives, right? And what you see in their rock art and the petroglyphs that show these portals. If you look at the legends of um, the Maya in you know, Quetzalcoatl, they, they claim that these 
white skin bearded men came down, right? So that to me sounds like they appeared through a portal again after the flood. So those are some working theories, but I had something else to share. Mm. And that is, there was, again, there's so much to see in this area. It's just chock full of ancient history. You went down in there and you found something, huh? Well, I think in the future, we nef- we need to have a joint megalithic marvels, blurry creatures, uh, US tour where we're going to all these. Yeah. These awesome. stops, you, right? I just want to know if your father-in-law was holding, holding your feet as you were dangling over inside that cliff looking for something. <laughs> and he's like, listen, just hold on to my, just hold on to this rope, pop. Don't let me go. <laughs> like, did you, I mean, your head has got to be on a swivel. You had to have gone into this cave and looked, I know you were looking for something. I took a lot of video. You guys saw the one video I made where I, with the drone, right? Yep. Yeah. So that was kind of a flying out of it perspective, 10,000 foot view. But inside I got some creepy video footage. At one time I was freaked out because if you go to the far left or right side of this cave, when you go in, there's this big deck they've built. So you can kind of look out and this cave is massive. The entrance is, is pretty, it looks smallish, but it's actually pretty wide. And so there's a lot of natural light that gets in there. So you can see pretty good without a flashlight. All that to say, if you go to the far left or right side, this thing rapidly descends down into these dark corners. And so I was on the left side going down and I found what looked almost like this tunnel in the far left end that went somewhere. And so I got video of this. I'll be releasing that soon, but I've never heard about this possible tunnel in Lovelock Cave. Maybe it didn't lead anywhere. But as far as I could see, it was going somewhere, but it was getting so steep that I was afraid that I was going to fall into this pit thing. So I did have a scary moment in Lovelock <laughs> Cave. Dang. But something else I wanted to share was there's so much to see. And not far from Lovelock Cave is a place you guys probably have heard of, Pyramid Lake. And this is also a, a site I really wanted to see, but we didn't end up having time. Near Pyramid Lake, it's this this ancient lake in the middle of nowhere with this pyramid-shaped natural structure in the middle of it. Not far from there are the, some people call them the Pyramid Lake petroglyphs, but the proper term is the uh, Winnemucca Lake petroglyphs. Right next to Pyramid Lake on the right side is a dry lake bed called the Winnemucca Lake. And that's where the oldest petroglyphs in North America are. These things are the grandest to look at. They're almost 3D. So a cool thing to point out is that I don't even know that you can legally see these uh, petroglyphs anymore without some kind of special access because they're on the Paiute reservation. And the signs I found said no trespassing. But Hugh Newman was there. I know you guys have had him on. He was there a couple years ago, took some amazing video footage up close of these. And he surmises that these Winnemucca Lake petroglyphs, which are huge, again, 3D in style. And again, mainstream archaeologists themselves say these are the oldest things that we've ever seen. They're at least 14,000 years old. Hugh surmises this was the language of the Sitika, the red-headed cannibalistic giants. were their symbols, their language. That's why they're so different than any other petroglyph we've seen. And it's really why you can't get there anymore to see them. So that's something to point out. But the last thing I'll say is I was reading through Hugh's book, Giants on Record, which is a great tool to have uh, when giant hunting. And it he has a excerpt he found, a legend that says in 1891, it was reported that an Indian of giant stature came to give the Paiutes trouble. And this giant warrior came from the north, and it says he took up his abode near Pyramid Lake and made a war on the Paiutes, killing many of their men. The giant was finally slain by a Paiute who uh, crept up behind him and drove a poison arrow between 
his blades. So there's another legend for part of the puzzle. So that was kind of my road trip camping ancient giant hunting excursion in a nutshell. It's great. Derek, look at this is crazy too. Like I, you know, we grew, this is where Nate and I grew up more or less in Northern California. And this is, these aren't, these aren't far excursions from where we grew up, Nate. Like these are a couple hours. Yeah. I had no idea about the pyramid Lake petroglyphs or the uh, Winnemucca petroglyphs. Looking at There's it. some blurred stuff out on Google maps. It's all blurred out in the middle. 14,000 years old. I mean, it's called pyramid Lake. I mean, come on. Yeah. What's under there, Derek? What's under there? Let me say this. Yeah, you can go kind of deep into Pyramid Lake and start researching and finding images. Again, it's called Pyramid Lake. There is this pyramidal shaped but you know, structure in the middle, kind of the middle right side of this lake. There's also people that have claimed to have found what they believe are super eroded sphinx like structure. You know, and, and when you look at it, it kind of does look like a sphinx. So again, listeners can research that. I believe that's at Pyramid Lake. So a lot, a lot more ancient uh, stuff there. Another thing is Spirit Cave, which is in the proximity of Lovelock Cave. It's a smaller cave, but the Smithsonian's own archaeologist uh, back in the day, early to mid 1900s, excavated mummies out of this cave that they say said were of at least 12,000 years old, I believe, and not of Native American. A descent. So, so many ancient mysteries, and hopefully, we made things a little less blurry for listeners. Wow. And okay, so Derek, my one of my questions is is like on this show we've 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 uncovered a lot, and maybe it's a simple, maybe it's just a simple answer. But last night we were talking to to Heather, who wrote about these underground tunnels in the Caribbean, that you know these caves. And then they said they could go all the way underground. She thinks they went all the way to Venezuela from these islands. Like they have massive cave underground networks. And we start out the show talking about caves underneath Shasta. And then you go to Lovelock Cave. Why are these things, why are they building these underground cave structures? I mean, is it just because they're they're getting hunted like you were saying? Or they have some sort of relationship with the underworld, underground they're always in these weird areas, hard to get to, and they're building these complicated structures. <laughs> it just seems like a really difficult thing to do. A to get there, and then B to like find this place, and then and then try to hollow it out and make it a. It's a consistent theme over and over again. We hear, and I, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that. Great question, boy. I mean, there's there's so much we could talk about with this. Yeah, I kind of my first reaction is to say. From what I've studied and learned and, and kind of believe regarding the ancient giants, we know they were hunted. We, we see that biblical example. And so, again, I believe that was continuing on for generations after. And so I, I think that's probably most likely why they were in caves, why they were underground, subterranean, building tunnels. I also think, you know, like you guys were talking on the episode with Dr. Judd, I believe, or Dr. Laura recently about Caesarea Philippi and Pan and that whole gates of hell area, right at the base of Mount Hermon, you know, it was the, it was the gate of the underworld. And there's so many legends there we can talk about on the the Minotaur episode, Hmm. but I think these things want to be close to hell. If that sounds, wow. uh, If that sounds accurate. Yeah. No, it makes sense. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, we get into it a lot and it, well, I mean, a lot, I mean, we haven't really talked about hollow earth or any of that stuff yet on the show, Luke, but you know, supposedly there's, this is, this is like the devil's best kept secret underground. There's all this, this like a whole nother world. And the Bigfoot creature goes down there a lot too. And people say giants come up from out of the ground and remote places it's like they don't want to be on the surface. They don't want to. See, I don't know why. Something about caves. Was it? Wasn't it the? Is it the Maya or the Inca that have the? Oh, the the cenotes. That yep, that's exactly right. The cenotes, right? So there's this weird thing with all that. Like mm-hmm. we have the gates of hell. At, like we talked about it at um, Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi, Mount Hermon, and then you have these caves in South America, the cenote, where they believe that was the way to get to. To Hades. And, and Derek, you you told us a story about going to that cave up on in Machu Picchu. 
Remember you oh, told yeah. us that crazy story where the, that guy was doing that ceremony or whatever and you were there? Yeah, that was one of the craziest experiences I've had. I, it, it's everywhere you go, there's these dynasties in these remote areas and there's a cave every time. Yeah. And that story, yeah. Two thoughts on that, Luke. One is we've probably all been to Mexico and you're like, I went to Chichen Itza a couple of years ago and I had the opportunity to go on a cenote. I was there when it was really hot and muggy. So it just didn't look appealing to me to jump into this thing, but yeah. all these people do and they think it's so luxurious, but little do they know, I mean, what went on in these things, right? I mean, bloodletting, sacrifices of the sickest kind. Now you're swimming in this thing, right? Or the the cave story, uh, Nate, that you reference for listeners that might not know what we're talking about. When I went to Peru a couple of years ago, there is a site called Nuapa Huaca, I believe, near kind of Machu Picchu and Ollantaytambo, but it's real remote. Most A lot of people don't uh, see this when they go to Peru to see Machu Picchu because they don't know about it. But way up in this mountainous cave, uh, again, similar to Lovelock, in fact, it's just a giant cave, except this one's got a precision megalithic architecture inside. One, one piece, it looks kind of like an altar or console, and another piece, which is like a, it, it looks like a wall with a door that goes straight into the mountain. Obviously, it's a faux door. It doesn't, you can't go through it physical, physically, but when we were up there, we were with this large group who was um, doing some new new age incantations and hmm. inviting spirits and opening themselves up. And I'm kind of watching this going, oh man, where is this going? And a guy was beating a drum and, and he was telling everybody, just open yourself up to basically the earth and, and the spirit. And he's got incense and, People are just kind of meditating, thinking this is really cool, you know, cool experience. When this guy, a uh, few people over to me, starts screaming bloody murder yeah, and convulsing. Obviously, everybody wakes up and they're looking at this guy, trying to help him. When he comes to it and he was scared for his life, he basically um, shared how he saw a, I believe it was a puma or a panther entity come through that portal that faux door and enter him and it literally scared the life out of him wow yeah don't don't go into caves and bang on banging on drums people it's real i mean i remember you telling me that story i i, I still remember that one i was like that was so good that was crazy it's fascinating though because it, it it just behooves the design right this idea that this is intentional this 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 door in the stone is intentional it's it's purposeful and if you ask for the purpose then it happens it's just it's always fascinating that people treat this stuff with you know with with white gloves sometimes like it's like it's just it's it's not dirty and it's not mm. it's not real you know or or it's real but it's it's inert right it's just just you know It'll, uh, it'll, uh, it'll level up your energy or something, right? And then you have these things where you're like, no, actually what you're doing is is dabbling in demonic. And what you're doing is actually inviting things to, things that want bodies to come and, and inhabit your body. And they will. They will. Derek. If you let them, yep. So I, I, you know, I've been kind of formulating some thoughts as we've done a lot of these shows. Let's look at this from a couple angles here. So the Giants original there was a concentration of let's say angelic dna in them and as time goes on it slowly just braids out of the population we talked about it last night on our episode that eventually they interbreed with humans and they get smaller and smaller and smaller and then there's there might be some of this dna living in in all of us we have no idea right and do you think that these entities had like half of a spiritual map of the way the world really works. They had half of the knowledge of the spiritual world. It's kind of like, you know, you, you get a map of the way the world really works and they cut it in half and you, you can kind of make sense of it, but you don't have the full angelic knowledge. You're not, you're not a true 
uh, a angelic being. You don't have the full picture of heaven and earth and the realms, but they kind of had half of it. So fast forward to humans today, we have none of it, right? So we're looking at this stuff like, how did they put these things together? But the ancient people had, they had this knowledge. But when we're talking about knowledge, they had understanding of the cosmos in a way that we were like fuddling around like little kids trying to put these these complicated blocks together. And we have no idea how they come go together. And we can only theorize. But it seems like, you know, that's kind of how I see it now. I don't know if that makes, I don't know if that, any of that makes any sense. I'm just... I'm trying to make sense of, of why it's so complicated to us when we look at it and we have no idea what it is or what they were doing, you know? No, great thoughts. There's so much going on, like you're alluding to, Nate, that, yeah, I don't think anybody has all the answers. Uh, all we can do is look at, obviously, we've got the Bible, we've got the Book of Enoch, we've got these ancient texts, we've got oral traditions we can pull from. We've got um, artifacts like with Lovelock Cave I talked about that we can look at and kind of piece together. Uh, um, and as I like to say, reconstruct the prehistoric past, right? I, I, I did have a thought when I was at Lovelock Cave, you know, because we've talked in previous episodes about Cyclops mm -hmm. and how if Cyclops really did exist, again, the megaliths in Europe are known as Cyclopean architecture and legend says they were built by the cyclops who not only had the strength but the knowledge to create these this precision stonework so i think of possible you know nephilim type giants like that and then i'm thinking of these lovelock cave giants which i believe really did exist i believe they were between seven and, and ten feet tall but these these ones in north america i don't know if primitive is the word but clearly we don't have, you know, megalithic architecture here in, in North America, like we see in Peru or Egypt. But it, so it's like the, it's like the giants that came here definitely lost some of the knowledge because in Truckee, like I talked about the Tahoe area, you've got granite, you've got granite there, just like in Machu Picchu to construct megaliths, right? We had the trailer park in, giants here. Right. Instead they're out in caves <laughs> making reed boats and, and this is corroborated when you read the Spanish conquistador accounts of the giants they found. And uh, I interviewed Alberino about this. Hugh Newman's a great one to talk about this too. They've collected all these oral traditions of the conquistadors, what they wrote in their own books regarding the giant, like Native Americans they found, they call them Native Americans, that were, again, eight to 10 feet tall, but very primitive in nature. And so uh, why were the giants here in caves or in mounds, right? Did they lose knowledge quicker than the others that were in Peru or elsewhere around the world? That's just something I'm, I'm thinking about, going to start researching, but I, that's the best I can do to answer your, your question. Nate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, it's, it, yeah. Sorry. I, gotta, I have a thought. I mean, it, just, it, just from a most basic common sense thought, like, if you were on the run or you're being hunted, where would you go? You would go to an island. You would go to a cave. You wouldn't set up and build a house. Like it, it just seems to me that in some of these spaces, we, you know, there was, there seemed to be just the, the, the giants were at least in, in this stage of, you know, of the epoch where like they were, they are at enmity with with humanity and being hunted. And so, if you're doing that, you know, if, if I'm if I'm running from the law, I'm not building a house, you know, and setting up and you know and and building, you know, not building stuff. I'm probably hiding somewhere uh, in something that's fortified and defensible. And that's kind of what we th when I, like, we talk about stuff with Aruba when we talk about Island of the Giants and we talk about some of the New World stuff. I mean, it doesn't seem like a far fetch to think that a lot of these giants left the old world to escape sort of the annihilation, like the conquest of Joshua, to, es to escape the judgment uh, in, in the old world. And this seems like a lot of them didn't have a chance to set up, set up shop necessarily. Mm. Uh, and then I think there's also an argument for lost knowledge too, that as you generationally are separated from, from the old knowledge, from, from the pre-flood golden age that, much like we don't understand how exactly how the pyramids were created or the technology that was used for some of these megaliths, right? That's your, that's your wheelhouse. Mm. 
now there's a separation or loss of knowledge and sort of attrition. So I think I, that's kind of how I think about it. Like it seems like the places they're found are places you would be if you were on the run or hiding or mm -hmm. kind of running for your life in some ways. Let's 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 look at this like let's compare it to human beings, right? Like you know the old saying, never fight, never fight in uh, Asia in a land battle, right? Why is that? Because they know how to do something very specific when it comes to the, the to war and the ground and the and under tunnels and things, right? The human beings are in certain areas of the world are highly skilled at whatever whatever they've just over time learned how to do. So two hundred watchers descend, right? Could you think there were physical anomalies for each watcher, and their offspring could have been completely different than the other ones? They're giants, but maybe they're just a different type of watcher and their offspring are a different type of giants. And that's why the old Testament has all these tribes. Like they had physical anomalies. Great question. Yeah, I think they were probably, so the watchers descend, they breed with earth women. I think they didn't necessarily know. Yeah. What exactly they were going to get. I mean, I've talked with, I did an interview with Gary Wayne once, and I think you guys have too. He kind of goes into some of the oral traditions and legends he's found in the Jewish writings where, you know, when these women would give birth, and if you got kids listening, you might want to pause this right now. But when the women would give birth who uh, bred with the fallen angels, their bodies could not handle when this giant came out. So it would literally just like a horror movie rip out of the belly, killing the, the earth mother. And you have other reports or legends where it was almost cannibalistic. I think it would even eat, eat the mother. So crazy pieces of information like that. Yes. Yeah, some of them had these six digits, probably not all of them, but some of them. Mm -hmm. Polydactyly. Yeah. Yep. The other crazy thing is like, Cro-Magnum man and Neanderthals, Darwinists, they'll say, well, this is, you know, proof of the missing link, right? Clearly these things are not normal humans. They, they do look ape-like. But what if all of these supposed Neanderthal skulls are, are, are Nephilim spawn, you know, mm -hmm. generations removed, and that's why they look so freakish. And that's why they're carbon dated so ancient, Right. They're not necessarily giants, but they've got these foreheads that just slap back. Or I, th I think I might have talked with you guys about this on an episode. There was seven foot skeletons found that had horns in their heads. So that was another strange anomaly. Yeah. So stuff like that. Yeah. I don't think it was just across the board. These are giants with six fingers. The Did the watchers even know the offspring would be giants? Maybe not. Um, but we know they loved their children. We know that they were horrified to find out that they were going to be destroyed. And so it's all just part of the puzzle, I guess. Well, yeah. I mean, do a show like this or yours long enough, you hear enough strange things. Just the giant skeleton reports. You have dwarves with them. You've got big giants. You've got ones that are 20 foot all the way down to 10 foot. Some of the guys on our show said they're even weight. That's the, those are the small guys. So who knows how they how big they really got? Some of the ancient reports of giant skeletons being dug up. I mean, some of those are like fifty feet, sixty feet. Some of those are wild stories. And then the mud fossil guys. That's a whole nother rabbit hole of how big these things got. But it just sounds. And if you think about this from a spiritual perspective, why would these angels all be anatomically exactly the same? They wouldn't be just like humans are different. You got all these different types of people. You, you got to think like, well, the angelic world's probably very similar. And so whatever their genetic DNA was per the watcher, you, you might've got a completely different creature coming out. Totally. And like, I like what you just said about, you know, as Tim would call it the elder race or the angels, you've got cherubim, seraphim, four living creatures. So, I mean, right there, you see this assortment, this variety of, of, yeah. Of this ange these angelic beings. The point is, they're all different. Why would their kids be all the same? They clearly probably most likely weren't. Just look at how diverse we are as humans, right? Colors and, and shapes and languages. So to me, it's pretty clear that they were 
this vast array of these hybrids. And then there's a whole rabbit trail on like the chimeric side and how these Nephilim genetically altered animals to create, as some would say, monsters, right? So there's so much there. All flesh was corrupted. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause like, I mean, just we did our episode just on the Cyclops, just the one eyed beast. And that's a crazy thing to think about. Like there's these one eyed giants. Why one eye? Well, I mean, you don't just, I mean, human beings don't just all of a sudden we have, yeah, I mean, obviously it can be a deformity or whatever, but maybe it goes all the way back to all the deformities we have maybe are from this point of corrupted creation. And then it's just genetic lottery of who gets the weird deformity when we could talk about that all, all day long, but that's a crazy creature, a one eyed giant. I think that there was probably a physical anomaly that separated these these tribes in the Old Testament. That's my thought. That's what I think made them migrate to an area and they looked or they had some sort of wild skill or deformity. Giants, according to Nate. Well, who knows? Yeah, right? Who knows? I mean, I, and, I, and then we talk about how, you know, like the Garden of Eden and some of these things like, you know, why would we have these fruit trees on earth if there wasn't fruit trees in heaven? And it, it, it seems to be this mirror. What we see here is a mirror of what happens in heaven. And we've uncovered that on our show in a lot of ways that we get these little clues on earth of how things are in heaven, right? Fruit trees, knowledge. of I mean, it starts with this. And then here we are. We are and human beings have a very similar. We have the earth and we're growing things. I don't know. Just some thoughts trying to put deep thoughts. That's what the podcast is for, Luke. Yeah, deep thoughts with Jack Andy. Classic, I guess, now. Anyway. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love love it from Love Lock. Yeah. Ooh, there you love go. Lock, love Lock is for lovers, right? Yeah, there's your next shirt. There you go. Yeah, we need to. Have, <laughs> that's the next thing. Yeah, merch is coming like yeah. you've never seen. Right? <laughs> love Lock. Hey, Love Lock it up. <laughs> <laughs> you lock it up. You. Hey, at some point listeners there's going to be a moment where i'm going to be holding on to luke's arm luke's going to be holding on to Derek's arm and we're going to be in the middle of a cave somewhere i don't know who the you next probably guy want is me on the anchor though just being yeah yeah you put the big guy the, not not dangling so much yeah so. <laughs> i'm holding on to luke's arm and then i'm holding on to Derek's, and we're, we're we're finding some weird anomaly and that's that's when we it's the blurry marvel Marvel's that's tour. when that's when they take us out and we finally discover it, right? That's right. Are we all going to disappear one day, Derek, if we keep going down this trail? Just like J.C. Brown. I was just going to say that. We don't want to end up like J.C. Brown. We just need a lot, enough friends, right? We need to just have a big enough tour where we don't get stolen. Go through the portal. I believe that J.C. Brown was not like his cousin, Leeward Brown. It was, the, <laughs> in fact, the baddest cat. In the in the whole town, so <laughs> Derek, we don't really have a lot to offer. We're a couple of dummies, and we appreciate you coming on. Hey, thanks for the invite. Fun as always to share, and uh, yeah, no, it's, just, it's fun. That, it's fun that you were in our like these areas that we're very familiar with. It's yeah, interesting. It's interesting. It just you feel even you know we grew up there and spent so much time in these spaces, not knowing sort of the richness of history that exists around you. I think we all have this idea that the that the new world, especially the West Coast, is so new, right? You know, the gold rush in the 1840s, and it's not like you, you can go to like you can go to Boston and see you know these these cemeteries with the founding fathers of our country. You know, it's it seems young, and then you realize that there's so much there's just a, a tapestry of history that exists out west as well, especially with the weirdness, man. Just the things about Shasta, you know, the Native people thinking that was that they did believe that was the center of the universe. So much blurriness there and in love lock and around tahoe and pyramid lega just it's it's awesome to revisit it so thank you for taking us back yeah to a place i think that is all too familiar to at least to us yeah i love it hey yeah and i didn't even get to talk about is it called dunsmere is that the little town by shasta yeah, that is yeah so we stopped there by accident and only because i was trying to get a picture that i think it's called the castle crags yeah. the mountainous weird looking peaks up there. And so I was doing a little research and I found some giant legends regarding the castle of crags. So we didn't even get to talk about that. All that to say, there is so much going on in the NorCal Nevada area. Get out and explore people. Yeah. 
man, Luke. megalithic tours, baby. Yeah, get going your- to Egypt, going to Dunsmuir. A little different. But- That's right. <laughs> and don't go on the trail without your megalithic marvels machete. Now, two for one. Blurry Creatures brought to you today by... <laughs> <laughs> we're idiots. We're just a couple of dummies. We, we have so much fun. And I, you know, I, Luke, to what you were just saying, I, I do think it's cool that you and I grew up there and here we are far away from those places, but it's kind of cool how God prepared us. I've traveled to most of these places and when you're talking about it, I'm like, yeah, I've been there. I've been there. You know, we're, whether it's um, Catalina Island, went there on my senior trip and these other places and drove up and down Northern California a thousand times. It's cool because it's like when you're talking about it, I can visually see it. And I just think it's it's something special that it's not just this idea. I'm like, man, I'm, we've been there. It's, it's basically and I'm backyard. just grateful that having skied as a kid at Mount Shasta didn't ski into a portal. Yeah, you didn't. Now, now you know. You know, you didn't know then. You could have. Could have. Maybe I'm, time, maybe I'm. Next, maybe we're all still in it. You know. You want to get weird. <laughs> and next time you, Luke. Next time you go skiing up there, bring that megalithic machete so you don't end up like Jason <laughs> Brown. <laughs> Derek, it's fantastic to see you, man. Yeah, buddy. Fr- and just we're grateful for your friendship and for and for you unpacking this trip. Tell us what's next for megalithic marbles, because I, you know, you had your trip to Egypt. He's gonna you're make always, some machetes. You're always up to something. No, in real life, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe that. Yeah. Supply chain's a little rough right now, so those yeah, may be coming exactly. next year. Yeah, they're coming for Christmas, twenty twenty two. But what's uh, what's going on in the megalithic marbles world, and what's what's on the horizon here? Really, though, I do need to uh, I do need to get some merch going. I don't know about machetes, but at least some cool t shirts like you guys got or hats. So I got to work on that. But then, uh, yeah, I got I'm still working on some tours for next year. W- wish they were up by now, but I'm waiting on my contacts, tour companies to kind of finalize their site so we can release that information. But hopefully, hopefully by the end of this month, we'll have a Egypt tour up that people can uh, sign up for. It's probably going to be in May of next year. And then hopefully a Peru tour as well next year, uh, later half of the year. So awesome. it's kind of it, guys. Yeah. Well, we got to get to some of these. We got to do some some Tennessee tours at least. We got to get you out here. We're we're thinking about Blurry Con and we're going to we're going to tempt you in. So you let us know, Derek, when you're not Indiana Jones and we're going to get you to Tennessee and we're going to do some we're going to do some hanging out in the flesh in the real life. And I'm excited about that. I am there. Yeah. Hopefully it's not in May or October, which I think are going to be these tour months. If it's not in those months, I am there. I've already got the money saved to come and we're just going to blurry it up. Look at right. you, man. That's my pitch to not have it in May or October. Just, yeah, just say, just save it. Right. Saving dollars for a blurry day. Little did exactly. Luke, little did, little did LA Marzulli know what he was saying to Derek on that fateful day of stay on the trail. What, what, what fire he was going to start in the soul of this man. Stay on the trail, kid. <laughs> it's it's like a G.I. Joe PSA. It's true. Oh, yeah. Stay on the trail, kid. I don't think he said kid, but yeah, stay <laughs> on the trail. He, he could have. I was kind of I was kind of Indiana Jones in it there. And we're thankful for all these dudes, these uh these wise sages that have that have come before us and laid the groundwork to help make us aware of all the strange things that are right in our backyard. So Derek, thanks so much. Follow Derek on Instagram at least. He's on TikTok now too, Megalithic Marvels. And see the goods. He's always making content, and you're always on the go, traveling the world. We love it, man. Thanks for uh, coming by Blurry Creatures often and sharing what you find. It was a pleasure, guys. Thanks so much. Had a blast. And uh, until next time, goodbye. And if, Thanks, there's a, and if there's a blacksmith out there that listens to our show, hit up Derek. He wants to make some knives. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's got to be pounding some steel right now listening to this show, you know. Horse and fire. All right. See ya.